Hello, good evening all. Myself, Dr. Malaya Mishra, presently working as a consultant and head of the department, uh, Yasoda Hospital, Sikandrabad unit. Today, it's being very privileged and honored to have one of our expert emergency doctor for a uh, weekly webinar. The topic today is pediatric trauma. And uh, here I would like the opportunity to invite Dr. Abdur Rehman. He is an excellent emergency physician uh, with uh, passionate uh, about uh, healthcare improvement and uh, like he is very good at excellent diagnostics and resuscitation skills. He has done his DNB emergency medicine from Malakpet branch. So as all of you know, pediatric trauma, this injury is the number one cause of killer in children between the age group of 1 to 18 years of age and it is very high in western world and come into the Indian scenarios. So we will have a good interactive session today. Over to you, Dr. Uh, Abdur Rahman. Please elaborate everything very clearly. And I hope we will have a fruitful discussion today. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you, Dr. Maranisha. Thank you so much. First of all, I would like to thank Dr. Sinat sir, Dr. Kiran Verma sir, and organizing team Ishada Hospitals Hyderabad for giving me this uh, wonderful opportunity. So without wasting further time, we'll go uh, for discussion. So today the topic will be pediatric trauma. So this is a just brief outline what we are going to discuss today. So we'll be discussing uh, basic epidemiology of the pediatric trauma and what are the anatomical and physiological considerations uh, to be kept in mind while dealing with the pediatric trauma and approach to primary survey and secondary survey and systemic injuries like traumatic brain injury and thoracoabdominal injuries. So coming to epidemiology, trauma is a leading cause of uh, death in pediatric age group. So this is a basic statistical data uh, taken from uh, US Department of Transportation because much of uh, Indian data is not available. So uh, this is the latest data in 2022. Of the 42,514 traffic fatalities, uh, approximately 1129, that is uh, approximately 3% were in Abhul, the pediatric age group. Can that is less than 14. Go back to your previous first slides. It is not visible, I guess. Now is it visible, sir? Coming to your flash, first slide. Yeah, this is the first slide. Are you able to see uh, my slides changing? Uh, not exactly. It's not happening here. Please give it a few seconds, sir. There is a technical glitch.
It's not changing from my side. Yeah, the first slide is we can able to see it. It's pediatric trauma. It's a first slide. No, no. No, is it changing? On the 17th slide is coming. You can go back to your previous first slide. Sir, uh, the slide changing now? Yes, yes, yes. Now it's changing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sorry for the interference. So this is a uh, basic outline which we are go uh, going to discuss today. Uh, this is a basic epi epidemiological data about the pediatric trauma. As we know, trauma is the leading cause of uh, death in pediatric age group. And uh, this is the data taken from US Department of Transportation in 2022. Out of 42,514 uh, traffic fatalities in pediatric age group, approximately 3% were, uh, were less than 14 years of age. And on an average, three children were killed and an estimated 429 children were injured every day in traffic crashes in 2022. Also, uh, pediatric injuries accounts for almost more than 8 million annual ED visits. So this statistical data signifies how much pediatric trauma is important. And this is the reason the healthcare facilities, the emergency physicians and pediatricians and general practitioners, they should have the curriculum and they should have the training in dealing with the pediatric trauma patients. And we know that uh, head injury is the most common cause of uh, pediatric trauma mortality. So this is a uh, report published in 2018 by uh, CDC. And if you see clearly here, just focus on the uh, blue, blue columns here. So there is an unintentional motor vehicle traffic uh, related death. This is the data showing 10 leading causes of injury deaths uh, by age group. So if you closely see at the in five to nine uh, years of age group, the unintentional motor vehicle traffic related uh, mortality is, uh, stands at number one rank. And almost in every age group, this traffic related fatalities uh, stands at uh, in the top three. So this signifies that so uh, trauma related deaths are very traumatic. So uh, this is uh, data. This is also data from 2022. And this also shows that almost 76% uh, of the child traffic fatalities uh, happen with the occupants that is in the motor vehicle uh, accidents. And coming to the basic anatomical considerations to be kept in mind while considering uh, pediatric trauma. So uh, coming to the coming to head and neck, pediatric population have proportionately uh, they have larger head, and because of that they are more uh, injury prone and they are more prone for heat loss, and there is also higher fulcrum of, on the spine, and uh, because of prominent occiput, the cervical spine immobilization becomes difficult and there will be malalignment of the airway. And uh, because of the ligamentous laxity, there is an increased risk of uh, uh, skivora, that is spinal cord injury without obvious radiological abnormality. And coming to the airway considerations, uh, in pediatric age group, the, uh, the larynx is more cephalot and also epiglottis is more floppy. Uh, because of that, we need to use straight blade, that is Miller's blade, in, especially in case of uh, infant, infant population when you are intubating. And because and there is also a larger tank and relatively larger soft tissues in the oropharynx, and that makes also difficult visualization of the airway. Also, uh, there is a uh, short trachea in the infant age group. Uh, because of that, uh, after intubations, we uh, we see uh, easily dislodgement of uh, endotracheal tubes, and uh, there is a narrow cricoid also. 
this is a older concept where because of their thinking because of a uh, narrow record uncuffed uh, intertracheal tube should be used but as per the recent guidelines especially acls 2020 guidelines so for any age group that is a uh, pediatric and both adult age group only cuffed intertracheal tubes are recommended and coming to uh, chest region uh, there is an increased chest wall complaint com complaints uh, because of the, this reason, they are more prone for rib fractures and there is more force transmission to the vital organs. And abdomen wise, uh, there is larger relative organ size and closer organ proximity. Uh, so they are more prone for multi organ injuries. In cardiopulmonary, there is an increased metabolic rate in the pediatric uh, population. So uh, there is wider range of normal uh, vital signs and there is also increased risk of hypoglycemia also. And uh, they have decreased pulmonary reserve. So, uh, they, they are more prone for hypoxia with hyperventilation and there is a differential BP response to hypotension and shock. So hypotension is a very late finding and we should not wait for that to happen. And among the general considerations, uh, the uh, pediatric population have, they have increased body surface area as compared to the adults. So they are, uh, there is an increased risk of hypothermia and uh, because of rapidly changing growth and development, uh, we have to, uh, go for the weight based drug dosing. So these are the basic anatomical considerations coming to uh, physiological considerations to be kept in mind while dealing the pediatric trauma patient as we all know that child's heart is rate dependent so the uh, very significant uh, blood loss uh, to be to happen uh, for uh, tachycardia to manifest and uh, modulating peripheral vascular resistance and we should remember that despite of 40 percent of blood volume also bp can remain normal in pediatric population so hypotension is very late and um, uh, very ominous sign of cardiovascular compromise in children. And uh, another important thing in respiratory system, uh, there is fixed tidal volume. So uh, minute ventilation can be maintained by increasing the respiratory rate. Also, they have very smaller functional residual capacity. So there is rapid desaturations uh, during apnea. These are the normal pediatric vitals. Uh, if we see in the infant and toddler age group, uh, normal pulse rate is 125 to 170, whereas uh, 100 to 160 for toddler age group. And systolic blood pressure, it is normal at 75 to 100 for infants and 80 to 110 for toddlers. And diastolic blood pressure, 30 to 70 for infants and 40 to 90 millimeters, millimeters of mercury for toddler age groups. So coming to the primary survey, uh, as we already know that for any trauma patient, uh, whether it is a adult or pediatric trauma patient, we have a systematic approach. ATLS has designed a very systematic approach. So why this systematic approach is important? Because we uh, because not to miss any life-threatening injuries, any lethal injuries are not to be missed. If we go in a systematic manner, if we go, uh, if we approach in a systematic assessment, then there is less, less likely that we can miss life-threatening injuries. So in the primary survey, uh, first uh, we will be approaching with the airway and cervical spine uh, immobilization and breathing and ventilation, circulation and hemorrhage control, disability assessment, events, exposure and environmental control, uh, fast and family. We will be discussing one by one in, in, in elaborate detail manner. Coming to the airway, so if you see, uh, com if you compare the infant and uh, adult airways, so infants have relatively larger soft issues of the oropharynx which can compromise the visualization during endotracheal intubation. Also, uh, the larynx and vocal cords are more cephalar and anterior, which makes sometimes which can make the intubation uh, very difficult. And you can see in this clinical image below, uh, also the infant's epiglottis is very floppy and we can see it is more anterior and cephalar. So for this reason, uh, we have to use a straight blade that is Miller's blade, especially in cases of uh, pediatric in intubations. And here you can, uh, we can, this is the, the position of the uh, infant or the child during intubation is also very important for successful intubation. As you can see, uh, we already discussed in the anatomical considerations, they have a very larger occiput. Because of the larger occiput, it causes the passive flexion of the cervical spine. So uh, in case of infant, you need to uh, place a towel under torso for proper alignment of the airway we should place at least one inch layer of the padding beneath the infant's entire torso, which will preserve the neutral alignment of the spinal column. And it will help in uh, easy visualization of the glottis uh, so that successful intubation happens. 
and other uh, in other cases like small child and nothing is required because uh, already in the in the neutral position only there is a proper alignment of the airway whereas in older child or adolescents you need to place the uh, towel under the occiput for the proper alignment of the airway and this is the image showing head tilt and chin lift this should be avoided in trauma patients because we don't know the uh, status of the cervical spine so head tilt and chin lift should be strictly avoided in case of uh, trauma patients whether it can be adult or pediatric trauma patients so this proper positioning and is very important during intubation for proper alignment of the airway which helps in easy visualization helping in first pass success rate of endotracheal intubation so we need to assess the airway patency first uh, see check for the signs of any partial obstruction or complete obstruction uh, signs of partial obstruction includes uh, stridulous airway noises and signs of complete obstruction includes inability to phonate to cry uh, producing audible breath sounds with adequate respiratory efforts these all indicates there is a complete airway obstruction uh, this is the point where you have to intervene promptly and watch for increased work of breathing and uh, any, any poor chest rise with bag and mask ventilation if needed uh, perform airway maneuvers like repositioning the airway uh, do jaw thrust and if necessary uh, do uh, oropharyngeal airway or nasopharyngeal airway uh, and one thing we need to remember here oropharyngeal airway it should be used only in unconscious patients it should not be used in a conscious patient whereas nasopharyngeal airway it can be used in any pediatric age group any uh, in any patient that is conscious or unconscious patients and very important thing pre oxygenation is very important i uh, in the further stage we'll uh, discuss about its important importance pre, especially in the for pre oxygenation for infants uh, 5 liters per minute and in the older children at least 15 liters per minute is required we need to restrict the c spine uh, if any polytrauma is suspected and uh, the needle cricothoracotomy we, uh, we should be able to perform needle cricothoracotomy if there is severe maxillofacial injuries and uh, regarding the surgical cricothoracotomy it is very rarely indicated especially in the case of uh, pediatric population so uh, this slides this slide signifies the importance of pre oxygenation in pediatric age group as you can see uh, this is this is the graph showing time from paralytic to desaturation less than 90% desaturation with no ongoing supplemental oxygen support in a pre oxygenated healthy child so you can see per Yeah, in the pediatric age group, especially infants, inf uh, in infants, the time to apnea is very lesser. So they have very lesser apnea time. So why this is important is you should not give prolonged attempts during intubation. Remember, this is very important. If you if you are not able to intubate or oxygenate, uh, if you are not able to intubate, just come out, try to do bag end mass, try to oxygenate the child, and then again go for uh intubation and try to uh, have a backup of most senior experienced provider available with you uh, as a backup because if you give more attempts without proper oxygen pre oxygenation so the, there are high chances that uh, patient because of uh, they, they will have desaturations with uh, prolonged apnea that will be very fatal coming to breathing and ventilation part Uh, assess the breath sounds and adequacy of the chest rise. Uh, check for air entry and symmetry of the chest wall movements. And you have to see the any paradoxical breathing and flail segments. This paradoxical breathing means there is discordant chest and abdominal movements. So this indicates that is a sign of impending respiratory failure. You should be very cautious here. And too fast or too slow breaths are also not good. And assist ventilation with bag and mask if required. Use pediatric bag and mask under thirty kgs. do not use adult bag and mask under 30 kg of weight because it will cause more barrow trauma to the child so under 30 kg only pediatric bag and mask and try to avoid excessive ventilation because because of excessive ventilation there will there will be gastric distension and there is risk of aspiration and also uh, impaired diaphragmatic function also so so better avoid excessive ventilation and during percussion and auscultation try to identify the signs and consider the possibility of hemoneumothorax also so at this point of time till breathing and ventilation part you should be able to identify life threatening injuries and the life threatening injuries i'll be discussing in the chest trauma slides but remember that 
unless and until you address any life threatening injury during your, your primary survey itself you should not proceed to the secondary survey any life threatening injury it should be identified and addressed during primary survey itself this is very very important and this is uh, during intubation this is a drug assist, drug assisted intubation or rapid sequence intubation for uh, first of all you need to preoxygenate that is very important we have discussed already and uh, we, we need to premedicate also with atropine sulfate 0.1 to 0.5 mg in infants infants only in less than one year age group and followed by sedation if the child is hypovolemic go for atomic 0.1 mg per kg or mid as 0.1 mg per kg and if the child is normal volemic you can go with the higher doses that is atomic 0.3 mg per kg and mid as 0.1 mg per kg followed by paralysis for paralytic agents we can take uh, scoline vecuronium or rocuronium scoline if the child is less than 10 kg go with 2 mg per kg if more than 10 kg go with 1 mg per kg or vecuronium 0.1 mg per kg or rocuronium 0.6 mg per kg and after intubation confirm the tube position with methods like five point auscultation and etc to confirmation chest x ray if possible with focus so coming to circulation part so we need to uh, control the external hemorrhage uh, with direct pressure and remember maintenance of systolic blood pressure does not exclude the shock this is very very important because because of child's increased physiological reserve it allows for maintenance of systolic blood pressure in the normal range even in the presence of shock so almost up to 30 to 40 percent of decrease in the circulating blood volume is required for drop in the systolic blood pressure so whenever a pediatric trauma patient comes and when there is no hypotension does not assume that this patient this uh, patient is not sick because almost 30 to 40 percent of blood volume loss of blood volume it requires for drop in the systolic blood pressure just lo and look for signs of shock like cool extremities decreased peripheral pulses delayed capillary refilling time and tachycardia even though bp is normal even though bp is normal in pediatric population check for signs of shock because hypotension is very late sign in pediatric age group and secure two large bore iv lines and uh, if the patient is in shock give 20 ml per kg uh, warm saline bolus for if there is a the child is in decompensated shock administer early administration of blood products is very important administer 10 to 20 ml per kg of prbc and remember here if after two attempts after two attempts of iv cannulation if failed cannulation consider for intraosseous infusion early via bone marrow needle uh use 18 you can use 18 gauze in the infants and you can use 15 gauze in the young children and how to know how to know what is the uh, normal blood pressure in the particular age group you can use this method the mean systolic blood pressure will be 90 plus 2 into age in years and for hypo to consider it as hypotension systolic blood pressure should be less than 70 plus 2 into age in years So uh, this is this this table is showing systemic responses to blood loss in the pediatric patients, and uh, there is it, there is a there will be mild blood loss uh, less than thirty percent of blood loss of volume it will be mild and thirty to forty five percent it will be moderate and more than forty five volume loss it will be severe. So what are the signs you will see here? So in the cardiovascular there will be increased heart rate, weak thready pulses, and there will be normal systolic blood pressure in. And normal pulse pressure in case of mild blood loss, whereas markedly increased heart rate and weak 3D central pulses, absent peripheral pulses, uh, low normal systolic blood pressures and narrow pulse pressures will be seen in case of moderate blood loss. And whereas tachycardia followed by bradycardia with very weak and absent central pulses, absent peripheral pulses, hypotension, narrow narrow pulse pressure, it will be seen in case of severe blood loss. And in mild blood loss, child will be anxious, irritable, and confused. Whereas in moderate blood loss, child will be lethargic. Dull, there will be dull response to the pain. And in severe blood loss, child will be comatose. And if you see the skin, skin will be cool, mottled, and there will be prolonged capillary refill in case of mild blood loss. And skin will be cyanotic, 
uh, and markedly prolonged capillary refill in moderate blood loss and skin will be pale and cold in case of severe blood loss. Whereas in urine output, urine output will be very low to very low in case of mild blood loss, minimal in case of moderate and none in case of severe blood loss. This is very important. So uh, this is a paper published in 2015 uh, defining the massive transfusion protocol in pediatric age group because earlier there was no clearly defined uh, range for massive transfusion protocol in pediatrics. So after take, using the largest existing registry of the transfused pediatric trauma patients, so they have decide, decided that a threshold of 40 ml per kg of all blood products given at any point, any time in first 24 hours it identifies the uh, critically injured children at high risk for early and in hospital death. So if any child requiring more than 40 ml per kg of blood products in 24 hours, so that, in, that, sig that signifies they are in the massive transfusion protocol. Coming to disability assessment, you can assess with uh, AVPO scale, the, which is currently recommended by PALS. Also, you can assess with modified pediatric uh, Glasgow coma score. In AVPO score, uh, we, we should assess whether it is whether child is awake or responding to verbal stimulus, responding to pain, or child is unresponsive. And you should check the pupils, check for pupillary asymmetry, and you have to check for extremity movement and tone, and check for the posturing and reflexes. This is the modified pediatric GCS. In eye opening. We give a score, a score of four spontaneous, score of three for two, if, if eye opening to voice, score of two for pain and one for none. In verbal response, whose are babbles, five, irritable cry, four, cries to pain, three, moans to pain, two, none, one. In case of motor response, if there is a spontaneous motor response, score of six. If withdraws to touch, score of five, withdraws to pain, four, abnormal flexion, three, abnormal extinction to none one. This is a modified pediatric GCS. And coming to exposure and environmental control, we have to fully undress and remove any wet clothing and uh, log rule is mandatory for checking uh, spine injuries and any, any other injuries like penetrating injuries. And very importantly, we have to make sure that we should avoid hypothermia in case of pediatric because uh, you know that there is increased metabolic rate and thin skin and the lack of substantial subcutaneous tissue leads to increased heat loss in pediatric age group. So the children are very more susceptible to hypothermia. So we have to make sure that we should avoid hypothermia. Otherwise, they will land up in uh, worsening coagulopathy. For avoid, may, avoiding hypothermia, maintain warm resuscitation environment, cover with warm blankets or external cooling devices, use warm humidified oxygen, you can use warm crystalloids and blood products if needed and convective warmers or radiant heat sources if temperature is less than 95. Coming to fast and family, this family thing is not there in the adult group, only in the pediatric group. Family indicates we should rapidly inform the evaluation in progress of the treatment and diagnosis to the parents and we should address their concerns. Whatever their concerns, we should address right promptly. And we should allow the family to be present during resuscitation because especially in the uh, infant age group, uh, the family will be more very con more con considered. They are, they are, they'll be in panic. So we should allow, allow them to be present during resuscitation. And EFAST, uh, EFAST is very, EFAST has less sensitivity in case of pediatric age group because 30% of the children with solid organ injury have no demonstrable free fluid on FAST. And, uh, Focus involving lungs and heart will be helpful to detect, detect occult pneumothorax and cardiac effusions. So occult findings will be, can be identified using focus, but, uh, sometimes or even despite of, despite the presence of organ injury, they can be missed in fast. And these are the adjuncts to primary survey. So after finishing the primary survey of airway, breathing, circulation, disability and environment and exposure, we should uh, proceed with the adjuncts like ECG, ABG if required, pulse oximetry. ETCO2, dial and police and uh, X-rays like chest X-ray, pelvic X-ray and C-spine X-ray and uh, fast and DPL, diagnostic peritoneal lavage.
coming to secondary survey in secondary survey what we do is we do uh, first we will take an ample history that is allergies medications past history last meal and events related to the injury we should take the ample history and we should proceed with complete head to toe examination this complete head to toe examination to assess for the secondary injuries any uh, other findings any other penetrating injuries we need we should be able to identify here and you can send lab investigations like trauma panel and uh, liver, fun liver function tests, urine, urine analysis, beta HCG in all girls more than eight years of age, and toxicology screen in case of teenage, teenage groups. And imaging tests can be performed here. And this is an article. Uh, this is showing a pediatric trauma big score predicting mortality in polytraumatized pediatric patients. So they take va valuables like base diff sheet. And this score uh, can, takes valuables like base ref sheet, INR, and GCS. So, how to calculate base ref sheet plus 2.5 into INR plus 15 minus GCS? So, if the score is less than 16, there is a high probability of survival of the pediatric trauma patient. So, this score was uh, introduced to decide whether to treat the patient here or to refer the patient, pediatric patient to a higher and specialized trauma center. This is the revised trauma score. Here, the valuables uh, considered are GCS, systolic blood pressure, and respiratory rate. If the revised trauma score is less than 12, then consider transfer to a pediatric trauma center because the mortality will be high if the revised trauma score is less than 12. And this is pediatric trauma score. Pediatric trauma score takes into consideration like uh, weight of the child. Airway, how is the airway, whether it is unmaintained, maintained or normal, what is the systolic blood pressure, level of consciousness and what are the, how are the wounds, whether they are major open, minor open or uh, no, no wounds and skeletal trauma. These are the variables considered for pediatric trauma score. If the pediatric trauma score is less than 8, here also we need to transfer to pediatric trauma center. So because uh, in the peripheries and in the local centers, these scores are very helpful. Because while taking a decision whether to retain the patient or whether to transfer the patient to another pediatric trauma, specialized pediatric trauma center, these scores will be very helpful. And coming to uh, traumatic, head injury, traumatic brain injury. So head injury is the leading cause of death and disability in children more than one year age group. First priority should be complete and rapid physiological resuscitation. And very importantly, we need to prevent the secondary brain insults like hypoxia, hypotension, hyperthermia, hyperglycemia, hypo or hypercapnia and seizures. We need to prevent all these secondary brain cells in pediatric head injury. And very importantly, if you maintain adequate MAP mean arterial pressure, then it is possible to ma maintain adequate cerebral perfusion pressures. Here, this is a PICAN rule. Uh, this is devised to decide whether a pediatric, whether a city head is required or not in case of pediatric trauma patient. PECAN implies pediatric emergency care applied research network. So in, in a pediatric age group less than two years of age, if there is altered mental status or Jesus less than 15 or any palpable skull fractures, if these are present, then CT head is recommended. If none of these are present, then look for LOC more than five seconds and non-frontal hematomas like parietal, occipital and temporal hematomas or uh, child is not acting normally or there is very severe mechanism of injury. Severe mechanism of injury uh, indicates, you can see the images below, uh, if a patient got ejected out of the vehicle from the motor vehicle crash or uh, patient uh, collision uh, while a uh, cyclist or pedestrian hit with, the, hit with motor vehicle collision without a helmet and fall more than three feet and high impact injury. So these are the severe mechanism of injuries. Here, if these uh, five things are not, not there, then no CT is, CT, is, CT is not required. And if these things are present, then we, uh, clinician can decide whether to go with observation versus CT head. In case of more than two years of age group, look for altered mental status, GCS less than 15, or any signs of basilar skull fracture. If these are present, then CT head is recommended. If none of these are present, look for history of loss of consciousness, history of vomiting or severe headache, or severe mechanism of injury. 
if these things are if these are present then clinicians discretion whether observation versus ct head if none of these are present then no ct is required this is very very useful tool this pecan rule is very useful tool in taking clinical decisions whether to perform ct brain or not so uh, these are the basic scalp injuries uh, various scalp injuries can happen in the pediatric age group especially in the newborns like uh, uh, caput succedunum cephal hematoma and subgaleal hemorrhage and coming to um, uh, more significant injuries like extradural hemorrhage this is bleeding from uh, middle meningeal vessels and subdural hemorrhage it can happen because of rupture of the bridging veins and very importantly signs of vessel skull fracture this is very important so various uh, signs of vessel skull fractures in includes uh, raccoon eyes uh, hemotympanum battle sign that is post auricular ecchymosis and csf otoria so these are all uh, these are all signs indicates there is a uh, base of skull fracture and if there is a fracture overlying vascular channel if there is a depressed fracture or if there is a diastatic fracture these indicates uh, poor pro very poor prognosis and here we can you can see uh, that is a growing fracture uh, or lept or leptomeningeal cyst and you have to look for uh, signs and symptoms of raised intracranial pressure various signs include uh, the signs and symptoms include headache neck stiffness altered level of consciousness persistent emesis and cranial cranial involvement and hypertension bradycardia and hypoventilation this is a pushing spread and also look for any decorticate and decerebrate posturing and look for full fontanel and split sutures and this image this is this is a setting sun sign this indicates uh, raised intracranial pressure this sign is helpful especially in pediatric population how to manage severe traumatic brain injury so you have to maintain uh, spine motion restriction perform intracranial intubation if gcs is less than 8 and if uh, maintain saturations more than 90% and psco2 of 35 to 45 mm of mercury maintain systolic blood pressure more than 70 plus 2 into age in years maintain cerebral per per perfusion pressure of 40 to 50 mm of mercury and maintain intracranial pressure of less than 20 mm of mercury and adequate sedation and pain management is very important icp management and maintain temperature of 36 to 38 degrees Uh, seizure prophylaxis with phenytoin or levetiracetam 20 mg per kg and transfusion if hemoglobin less than 7 g per dl especially for icp management maintain head and elevation 30 degrees uh, head should be in the midline and uh, hyperventilation of psco2 with a target range of 38 to 42 mm of mercury and uh, you can use 3% mannitol 0.5 to 1 g per kg you can use 3% normal saline 5 ml per kg bolus followed by 0.1 ml per kg per hour and you should maintain sodium at 155 to 165 mL per liter treat seizures and prevent fever and final resort decompress the cranial artery these are all the measures for management of raised intracranial pressure coming to thoracic trauma uh, most common mechanism will be rta or falls and we know that there is 20 fold increase in the mortality with chest trauma and penetrating trauma is more lethal than blunt trauma especially in pediatric populations penetrating trauma at or below the level of nipple we should assume there is a concurrent trauma that is thoraco abdominal both chest and abdomen are involved and see for the sequel of blunt injury like hemoneumothorax pulmonary contusions myocardial injury vascular injury and any presence of rib fractures this uh, this is a differentiation between tension hemothorax versus massive hemothorax this is very important so i already told you that in primary survey itself these life threatening injuries should be identified and they should be addressed in primary survey survey itself you should not proceed further without addressing these life threatening injuries so in tension hemothorax there is there, there is a pulmonary air leak in one way valve arrangement whereas in massive hemothorax injury to intercostal vessels most commonly intercostal vessels also can be injury to internal thoracic vessels also hypotension is present in both of them breath sounds are absent in both tracheal shift will be present in both but it is late in case of massive hemothorax uh, jvp is raised in tension hemothorax and it is collapsed in case of massive hemothorax and coming to percussion there will be hyper resident note in tension hemothorax and dull percussion note here and very importantly in management needle thoracostomy should be done and it the location is second intercostal space mid clavicular line 
this is a new update which is given in ATLS 10th edition. And in case of massive hemothorax, uh, you may need to perform tube thoracostomy, that is ICD and thoracotomy. And the indications for thoracotomy includes more than 50 ml per kg chest tube collection. And if there is a persistent blood loss, more than 2 to 4 ml per kg per hour over 3 hours. If these indications are present, e even you need to perform thoracotomy also. So these are the main gross differences between tension hemothorax and massive hemothorax. So you, you should be confident and even able to identify these life-threatening injuries without any mode of investigation also. With clinically, with clinical acumen only, you should be able to identify and we should be able to promptly address in right time because these are the killers. So remember, whenever you are dealing a trauma patient, you should be able to identify the killers first. If you fail to identify the killers first, then patient will be out of hands. So this is cardiac tamponade, another killer where the extra visited blood fills the pericardial space and impairs the cardiac feeling during diastole. And how to identify clinically? There will be hypotension, raised JVP and muffled heart sounds. This classical triad is known as Beck's triad. And in ECG, you can see tachycardia with low voltage complexes. And this cardiac tamponade can be detected within seconds using ultrasound, that is focus. And management, if uh, hemodynamically unstable and life-threatening, then you need to go for immediate pericardiosynthesis or pericardiotomy. Coming to abdominal trauma, it is the third leading cause of traumatic death in children. And 90% of the abdominal trauma is blunt and it is mostly due to motor vehicle collisions, pedestrian injuries, falls, bicycle handlebar and infected injury. And spleen is the most common solid organ in injured in case of abdominal trauma. And very important, uh, we, we will be encountering in our emergency departments when to do uh, when to perform a CT uh, and when to not. And these are the there are some rules which helps us to identify to decide whether to perform imaging or not. Here there are few indications uh, for performing CT in abdominal injury in pediatrics. Uh, the indications include polytrauma victim victims and the concerning signs like in abdominal tenderness, peritonitis, and presence of seed belt sign. I'll be discussing in the later slide and elevated liver enzymes and decreasing hemoglobin or hematocrit and there is a gross hematuria. So if these signs are present, then you should go for uh, uh, abdominal imaging. So this is PECAN rule, Pediatric Emergency Care Applied Research Network, PECAN rule. Uh, children are classified as very low risk for intra-abdominal injury and may forego uh, CT if they meet the following criteria. And this PECAN rule has 97% sensitivity here. The criteria include no evidence of abdominal or thoracic wall trauma, GCS more than 13, there is no abdominal pain or tenderness, normal breath sounds, and there is no vomiting after injury. If, they, if this, any, any of these signs are not there, then you can forego CT. CT abdomen is not required and not recommended. And coming to uh, liver and splenic injuries, uh, spleen is the most common solid organ injury followed by liver. And uh, this, there is Keher sign. Keher sign indicates because of the subcapsular splenic hematoma, uh, because of the diaphragmatic irritation, there will be referred pain at the tip of the shoulder. So it, this indicates the peritoneal collection. Because of the peritoneal collection, it, this causes the diaphragmatic irritation and this pain is referred at the tip of the shoulder. So any trauma victim, if they are complaining uh, the sh regarding about their complaining shoulder pain, do not neglect it. Consider abdominal injury. Consider bleeding, whether it can be subcap, whether it can be splenic or, or liver hematoma. And especially uh, there will uh, more than 95% of cases, there, there will be non-operative management only, but we should be very cautious uh, in cases of subcapsular hematoma. And in pediatric age group, mostly there will be conservative management, uh, fluid, fluid you should include fluid resuscitation and serial abdominal exams are very important. This is the main staff treatment. Very rarely surgical treatment is required. And you, can, you have to serially uh, check the labs where is the decrease in the hemoglobin and hematocrit. And if required, go for blood transfusion, and angioembolization and laparotomy. And if you perform laparotomy and splenectomy, very importantly, you should consider post splenectomy vaccination for meningococcal and septococcal pneumonia. Then is uh, renal injury. Uh, 
pediatric age group is more susceptible to trauma because of the increased mobility of kidneys and lack of protective musculature in the kidneys and uh, renal injuries are more associated with rapid deceleration mechanisms because it is a retroperitoneal organ uh, signs and symptoms will be very less obvious only a few uh, symptoms can include like dull back pain or ecchymosis in the costo vertebral region and uh, hematuria may present you should you should perform uh, renal ultrasound and ct to rule out genitourinary injury most of the times there will be conservative management and if required you can go for you should go for angiomalization stenting percutaneous drainage to manage the complications <laughs> coming to hollow viscous injury this is where uh, less common in pediatric population uh, this includes bowel perforation bowel wall hematoma and mesenteric tears we should suspect hollow viscous injury if there is persistent abdominal pain or bilious vomiting is present and peritonitis or fever is present this is uh, very important <clears throat> seat belt injury complex the image is showing seat belt sign if seat belt sign is shown there is more than five fold risk of uh, small bowel injury this uh, seat belt sign signifies signifies there is a small bowel injury also there are chance fractures of lumbar spine these are <clears throat> More than fifty percent uh, associated with intra-abdominal injuries. What happens in this seat belt injury complex is <clears throat> because of uh, acceleration and deceleration forces. Uh, these acceleration and deceleration forces they crush the bubble between the seat belt and the spine. So uh, with this mechanism, small bowel injury will happen. These are my references. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Abdul Rahman. It's such a wonderful discussion about pediatric trauma, such an illustrative way of discussing the whole topic, starting from primary survey, including your airway, breathing, circulation, disability, and coming into the secondary survey. For all uh, region wise, you have discussed uh, blunt trauma, abdomen, thoracic injuries, how to protect a cervical spine, pick and rule, everything you have discussed so elaborately. So now I would like to invite for the question and answer session. So we have a question here uh, regarding diagnostic peritoneal lavage. Uh, diagnostic yeah. peritoneal lavage has been, TPL. Been, has yeah, been TPL. removed, right? Or is it still considered in the pediatric age group? Yeah. So actually, diagnostic peritoneal lavage now uh, nowadays it is not recommended. Especially, it is helpful in centers where there is uh, imaging is not immediately present, and uh, especially if the patient is very hemodynamically unstable, where you cannot uh, shift the patient for imaging. So those uh, scenarios only diagnostic peritoneal lavage is uh, indicator or recommended. Otherwise, okay. it is not recommended nowadays. Yeah, very true. This is not being practiced these days. So it is an obsolete thing now. When the patient is really very sick, not able to shift to the uh, radiology for uh, CT abdomen and all, we can do it. But we, we are not practicing this DPL anymore in these current guidelines. Any more questions? As you have correctly mentioned, the current uh, guidelines have changed to needle decompressions. It is from second intercostal space, mid-clavicular line these days. You have correctly mentioned the current, uh, like uh, recent ATLS guidelines, what it is says. And uh, for damage control resuscitations, as you have correctly mentioned, initial fluid bolus is 20 ml per kg, normal uh, wall no, warm saline, followed by 10 to 12, 20 ml of kg uh, that packed RVCs, then uh, 10 to 20 ml per kg FAPs and platelets as massive transmission protocols that everyone has to understand. Any more queries? Any more questions? This is a very vast topic indeed. So he has covered all the way, starting from primary survey, secondary survey, everything details in a very illustrative way.
any more questions i think no more questions from audience and audience said bye see your talks Indeed, Dr. Abdul Rahman, it's a very illustrative way of explaining whole uh, pediatric trauma in within the span of 30 minutes. And uh, you have discussed, you have tossed all the critical points. So that is really needed for day-to-day -day practice in emergency emergency room. And uh, thank you so much once again for your uh, wonderful talk. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you thank so you. much. Thank you so much. Thank you. I, I thank Ishada Group for giving me this wonderful opportunity. Thank you. Thank you so much.